everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to embark on a little knife making uh, series. I'm going to make this um, Kepart knife. Here's an advertisement um, for over 100 years ago. If you don't know who Kepart was, Horace Kepart was a, um, an outdoorsman, a writer, uh, primarily on the East Coast. Um, he did, you know, what they call tramping and uh, he'd go out and, uh, you know, uh, guide people and, and go out himself. And he uh, basically is considered like the, you know, the godfather of uh, the outdoors. So um, this was the knife he carried, and I'll, I'll give you a couple more dimensions and explanation on it. And there's something about it that I just, I just love. So I wanted to make one. Um, actually, I wanted to buy one, and they were expensive. A couple different companies make them, and uh, they run from anywhere from like 130 bucks to way up into the four or five hundred dollar range, depending on who made it. So I decided, hey, let's try to make one, you know, uh, in my garage. So we're going to see how it comes out. But uh, basically back then they sold it for $1.75 for a 4-inch blade and 2 bucks for a 5-inch blade. Now I'm going to show you some differences. Okay? This is the only known original outside of, the, uh, outside of a museum. Okay? This one I believe is eight and a half inches okay the way he described the knife was this was Horace's knife the way he described it was its blade and handle are four and a quarter inches long the blade being one inch wide one eighth of an inch thick on the back broad pointed continued through the handle as it has been riveted to it it's an oval cross section long enough to give a good grip in the whole hand with no sharp edges uh, has a quarter inch knob behind the cutting edge as a guard, but there's no guard in the back for it would be useless and in the way. It only weighs four ounces. It was made by a country blacksmith. And it's one of the homeliest things I ever saw, but it ha outlived, in my affections, the score of other knives I've used. So, it's kind of a nondescript, <coughs> excuse me, a nondescript knife. As you can see, this is that little knob he was talking about. Okay. Pretty thin. The handle scales are pretty thin. So now they make what they call a mini Kepart. And I, I made a diagram up of a couple different sizes. So the mini Kepart was pretty small. Okay. I actually made some samples because you kind of want to be able to feel it. Okay. So this one here is the mini Kepart. And the total length of that. Is just about seven and a half inches it just it was a tad too small for me I kind of liked it but it, again a tad too small so I took that one out of the mix now this one is a four inch blade and four inch handle this I felt fit perfectly that's this size now for me that fit perfectly all right I loved it now, the dimensions, like I said, are a little bit different. It's just a little over 7 eighths of an inch wide here. But I like the size. Now, this is the size that they're selling these days. If you look, it's an inch bigger than this one. They run anywhere from 9 to 10 inches long. And to me, having it on your belt, uh, I don't know, just a little too big for me. I mean, it kind of feels nice. But this one feels perfect. So you got the three different sizes here that I was messing with. So I chose this middle one, which is four inches for the, the blade and four inches for the handle. Okay. Now, I bought a piece of 1095 high carbon steel, one eighth of an inch thick. And um, it was advertised as eight inches long. Now, uh, the advertiser said that there was a tolerance of basically an eighth of an inch. So I was hoping it would be an eighth of an inch longer, but it actually was a sixteenth of an inch shorter. So this is actually going to end up being seven and fifteen sixteenths. So for all intents and purposes, we'll call it 
4 and 4. So I have a, a little template here I cut out to fit right on this blank. There you got it. Okay. So it's going to be pretty true to the original. Um, his was, again, 8, 8 and a half inches. But uh, this is going to be good. Nice size. It's going to fit good. So now I have some challenges on how to cut this out, whether I'm going to use a hacksaw or a uh, cutoff wheel and a grind, uh, you know, an angle grinder. Um, I also made a bunch of jigs. I made a jig to hold my jigsaw upside down uh, on a flat surface. So um, I'm going to bring out some of my jigs. I'm going to show you the jigs, and then uh, we'll get at it. All right, so here's a bunch of stuff I have here. Um, this here is going to be a file guide. All right, just two pieces of um, steel with a couple of nuts tack welded onto the bottom. And this is going to get used to create the plunge line. Okay, these get screwed down so that I have a guide for my file. Um, I wish this was hardenable steel, but it's not. It's just regular mild steel. So I took the file and I ground off. This is just a little piece of file that I had that I was making fire strikers, uh, flint strikers from. And I ground down the um, the actual file part on the edge so it doesn't damage the end of this. And I can create the plunge line. Okay. So we have that. Then we have this. Just a simple angle iron with a hole, a uh, 15 16 bolt going through it, um, tapped so that I can create the angle for putting the grind in, okay, on the bevel on the blade, which I'll explain to you in a moment. This here is just a little piece of aluminum with a couple screws tapped, drilled and tapped into it. This is going to go on my uh, four inch belt sander. To create an area where I could put the blade against that plunge line because if I didn't have this the actual um, surface of the grinder is wider than the blade so I wouldn't be able to get that grind in correctly so I have this then this here is just a little scribe I think they call them marking gauges so it's just a little I don't even know what this is called but uh, I just put a nail in there, and I ground the edge, as you can see. It comes to a point. And then you set the depth, and then you could mark whatever you want. You put it against here like this, and you can mark it. And I'll show you how we're going to mark it when we get to that point. And then um, this is just some really, really, really powerful magnets. And this is how I can hold this when I'm grinding it. And I actually have a little piece of wood in the middle of it because... Whoa. I mean, they are extremely powerful, okay? Um, if you're going to use these, these came out of hard drives. If you're going to use these, just be careful. I've seen people get hurt <laughs> with these, okay? So we have those magnets. This is just a sample piece that I was messing around with, uh, mild steel. Kind of mimics exactly the size of uh, the knife. So um, one other thing I wanted to show you is the grind. Let me grab that and bring that All right, over. This is the last thing we we're talk about until, uh, before we actually get into making it. So these are the different types of grinds. Um, the, most of the knives that I saw today, uh, the re reproductions, they're using a flat grind. Okay. Um, the other types of grinds, basic ones, right, are the the Scandi grind, the hollow, the hollow grind, and then the convex. Now the original knife was actually a full convex. So what that would look like is, it would actually be like this. Okay, it would probably come down further where the middle of the blade was the thickest part. And he felt that that design, that, that grind, was the best grind when he was processing meat, or processing wood, right? But that's a very tricky grind to make, um, especially for a total newbie like me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a convex, but we're probably only going to go up about a third. Okay, so I'm only probably going to go up to about there. So I'll keep it full thickness on the back of the spine, and then I'll come down and I'll just kind of feather that in to a convex grind the best I could. 
So um, there's going to be some experimentation going on. Like I said, hopefully I can cut it out with my little jigsaw setup. Or, you know, I might have to use a grinder. So we'll see. So let's get at it. Okay, so we're going to draw the outline onto the steel. I just have it on this little um, setup here. If you can see right here, I have the jigsaw blade. So basically, it's just um, the jigsaw is attached. Let's see if I can get a better picture of this. To the bottom of this piece of wood. That's all it is. All right. So let's get that drawn on there. Alright, so we have that drawn on there. Now we're going to attempt to cut this with that jigsaw blade. So let me get it reset up and we'll get at it. Alright, here's the attempt to cut this. It's going to be a lot of noise. I'm going to have to adjust the speed of this. I'll block it out. not working okay new blade all right look at that my Swiss brand new Swiss made Vermont American blades didn't work these cheapo bimetal jigsaw blades from Harbor Freight seem to be doing the trick so you saw how I'm doing it. I'm going to uh, cut out the rest of it, and then we'll be back. All right, so I got it cut out. Um, I went through, let's see, there's one blade in there and two other blades I had to change. So um, we went through three, three blades, which is not bad. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. And I got to save the extra pieces. If I would have did this with an angle grinder, I would have definitely lost a lot of this and uh this is a future uh fire striker uh flint striker so i'm gonna wrap this up for the end of part one i don't want to make these too long um in the next uh part we'll start uh doing some grinding on this and uh, we'll continue on so thanks for watching everyone i really appreciate your views i appreciate your comments and uh we'll see you in part two